headed to the National Herbarium, located within the grounds of the Royal Botanic Gardens, Melbourne, to dive into the world of the really tiny. And my guide is the collections manager here, Dr Pina Milne. Millie, I want to show you this book. This was published in 1651. Oh, my Lord, look at that. So that's pre-Linnaean yes, classification, pre the, the two-name system. That's correct. But as well as being in charge of their incredible treasures, she has a deep and abiding interest in the tiny and oft-forgotten branch of the plant kingdom, the bryophytes. A bryophyte is a... It's the title for a whole group of plants, really, um, and the plants fall into three categories. There's mosses, liverworts and hornworts. They're found in fresh water. They're found in all sorts of habitats, from arid, semi-arid, to tropical rainforests. I think my passion um, for the bryophytes started um, in a, an undergraduate study that I did, and it opened my eyes to a group of plants that are often overlooked. And over time, I've just grown to really appreciate how amazing they are. So Millie, here you see a really nice collection of rocks and you'll see a whole lot of different mosses. In this case, you can see this lovely matting moss and it's really quite dense. And if you touch it, you can see it holds quite a fair bit of moisture. Ah, oh, yeah. And it's, you know, you can see that it would be the perfect environment for a seed to land in it and germinate and be supported right that way through. In some moss beds, that's exactly what happens. Seeds will fall into that and it'll then um, germinate and can form into a, a small shrub, for example. If we have a look at this here, we've got mosses and we have the green shoots at the base, but just, just above that you can see the filaments extending upwards and at the very top of some of those you'll see what we call the capsule. So at the bottom, the green leafy part is what we call the gametophyte because yep. that's where the egg and sperm is produced. If fertilisation takes place, we then get this structure which we call the sporophyte and you've got like a stalk, a capsule, and it's within that capsule that you get spores being produced. And some of them you can see are completely encapsulated by a Moisture. drop of water. Exactly. And so how many species are on each of these rocks, do you think? A good way of looking at it, just look at the different shades of green. Yep. And often that's indicative. So these dendroid mosses here is one species. The one that's extending right through there is another. These with the upright that have got the sporophytes is another. And then this here that's running along this edge here is another species again. So you up to even four or five different species just within that area there. So what role are they playing in the garden or in ecology? Bryophytes play a really significant role for example, in bare soil, some of the earliest colonisers of bare soil, um, sometimes directly after fire, you also find that, of course, bryophytes are photosynthetic. So therefore, they take in carbon dioxide. Because they take up so much water, they often refer to as being dehumidifiers. They're also important as shelter for invertebrates. The other important thing, of course, is aesthetic. We know that they're really important in Zen gardens. You have a look at bonsai collectors, you have a look at their bonsai plants. What's the understory? Bryophytes. Gosh, they really will grow absolutely anywhere, won't they? Yeah, you can see them all across the top of that brick and then across this one here, forming a lovely colony. Oh, so beautiful. Gosh, there is so much going on in this little pot. It's amazing. What you've picked up there is a liverwort. In this case, it's a thallus liverwort. You can see that it's lobes. And also, you'll notice that there are gemicups, which hold the little specialised asexual structures. Plus, you'll see that there's a young female there and a young male in this area here. And then if you lift up each thallus, you'll notice the little rhizoids. Mm and that's how they adhere to the surface. It does look like a root system. Yes, it does. If we have a look at this here, again, we've got a large colony of thallus liverwort, and you can see the males extending upwards. So that's the little flat sort of hooked. Yes, 
and here we have the female that looks like little radiating arms. And again, little gemi cups forming quite large circles and inside with the specialised structures called gemi. And so if the rain hit that, it would splash them out yes. and off they go into the world. Yes, and then they can establish a new plant. Out of the nursery and into the wilds of the botanic gardens, Pina's found an example of how Mother Nature finds innovative uses for the family of bryophytes. Pina, it's obvious that plants mean things to other plants and they're so connected, but how amazing to see them being used by animals as well. These bird nests are exquisite. This one here in particular, it's just so perfect and they've interwoven the mosses all around the edges and then if you lift the bottom, you can actually see them all extend down into here. And then in this one here, it's quite extensive and all interwoven right throughout the entire nest. There's even spiders' webs and lichen holding this all together. And I mean, it does remind you that you don't know how important these plants are because we don't know exactly how they're being used. Exactly. And this is two very nice examples. I often think we walk into a rainforest and all we see is the tall trees, shrubs and ferns and yet all around us are these amazing bryophytes and if you stop to have a look, you can just see so much diversity. 